Okay, we're uh, close on time, but I'll try not to keep you too long on this, uh, this last one, because, you know, it's always good to talk to a hangry crowd. <laughs> uh, so <coughs> we thought to kind of wrap up this series of talks um, with sort of where we started. And so what I'll, I'm going to do is just very quickly um, give you a run through of one component of the, uh, the fin whale acoustic work we've, we've been doing. And this uh, you know, ties back into the beginning of how we got here. And my, my point with this is to show you um, at least how I'm thinking about this sort of question. And it, it is, you know, given that we have acoustic data, um, what can we, how can we use that to ask questions about population structure where that is going to be one of our primary um, sources for, for inference, at least for now, and, and how am we thinking about using it, and hopefully um, that'll sort of start sparking uh, some thoughts about um, where we can go with it and, and issues involved in it. So that's, that's kind of the goal with, with this short little talk. So as we, um, you know, we're saying that we have uh, fin whales distributed um, globally in, in the, all the ocean basins, we are looking at just one region in the North Pacific. So we're, we're, we're looking right now at what uh, potential structure we have there. And the issue is that we know very little about fin whale structure or even have any hypotheses. Um, when we start thinking about baleen whale structure, we have as a, um, as a scenario, as kind of a, a type, the humpbacks, where we have a lot of knowledge about feeding grounds and, and breeding grounds and their migratory pathways um, you know, from these, from sort of low latitude um, breeding grounds up to, to high latitudes. And for humpbacks, we've, we've got that situation mapped out um, fairly well. For fin whales, it's a totally different story. This is um, an image from um, a nice paper that Sally Misrock did compiling discovery tags where whalers would um, shoot uh, uh, whales with these embedded tags, and then later on when they were killed, they would be recovered. And there, this showed sort of marks and recoveries, and so we get some sense of where these whales um, were potentially what their, their ranges were, but that doesn't tell us as much as we'd like to know about how they're being structured. Um, they're over, it's over a long period of time, and, and it's not enough data to begin to um, really have a sense of, of what the overall structure is. There are, are fin whales that are going um, far th south, or as far south as um, Baja. They're feeding up in the Chukchi, um, they're often, they're also sometimes seen around Hawaii, and so we have places where we have very little information, they're offshore, how do we handle this? I have 500 um, uh, genetic sequences from these animals, and I have no idea how to use them. I, I have no idea how to start to stratify them to ask questions about population structure. Um, so the question, so we, we want to use acoustics. Fin whales have a fairly simple um, acoustic repertoire. They're the stereotypical 20 hertz calls. Um, they're two main types of notes that have been um, uh, described. One is a slightly lower frequency um, term backbeat, and then a slightly higher frequency classic. It's thought that only um, the males sing. And the question is, with this limited repertoire, can we uh, use this information to identify stock boundaries, look at connectivity between regions. Um, so with um, a bunch of much smarter acousticians that had access to some bottom-mounted hydrophones, we collected um, fin whale recordings in the, the spring, which are the circles, and the fall, which are the triangles, from several regions around the North Pacific over multiple years. So there's overlap in time and, and space. Um, in some of these collections. Um, and what we have here is a depiction of just the summary of those, those regions. The color is to denote kind of the proportion of, those, of the backbeat notes in, in green, um, shading to um, orange, which has a full proportion of C. So 
here the scale is 100% um, B and then 100% C in orange. And you can see that there's quite a bit of variability throughout the region um, with some having sort of equal proportion. And where we had different C's in spring, fall, in some you can see that there's different proportions while in others the proportions are closer to similar. So, you know, what does this mean? How do we actually use this to start um, making hypotheses about connectivity? Well, what this simple picture does is it, it is, it's a nice place to start, but of course the reality is different um, that these backbeats and um, classic notes, these Bs and Cs, are occurring in a variety of patterns. Um, this is uh, from a paper by um, Anna Sirovic, who is looking at uh, variability, temporal and spatial variability, just in Southern California and the Gulf of California. And you can see that there's um, multiple kinds of patterns, and they're using these notes in, in, sort of in different ways to form different types of, of, of songs. And she um, you know, made this sort of nice image looking at the frequency of, uh, of triplets and doublets of different kinds in these different regions. And you can see that there's both geographical um, variability and also within a region, this is um, a 2005 to 2012 set of samples, and this is 2001, 2003, there's change over time in, how, in, in the frequency of these different sorts of calls. So again, how can we start to um, piece these together to, to, to look at sort of similarities and differences? Um, this is looking at them as just sort of triplets and doublets, and, and in, in these kinds of, uh, in these studies that have historically been done, they've gone into the data and have said, here's a good sequence of doublets, here's a good sequence of triplets. Um, and now I'm just going to look at the frequency. I'm also going to look at, and they, they've looked at uh, the internode interval between these I identified um, s types of calls. Um, but the data that we're actually we're, we're getting, um, they're not always that sort of clear. They're not always easy to say, this is a doublet, this is a triplet. And this is just a sample of some, uh, some calls from the data that we had. And in some cases, you can see sort of some regular patterning, but it, in other cases, there's um, variability such that you would not, you might not be able to say, you know, this is a BC, um, BC call. Um, this has, you know, several Cs in a row. Uh, what, where would you place this? And then given that they're of different lengths, how do you go about sort of comparing these calls if they're of different types and different lengths um, and that's really the challenge that, that I tackled. So my, pa my, my, my strategy was to take a sequence and to try to figure out how to extract information that will allow me to quantify any sequence in a comparable way. And as I stared at these for years and years, I uh, realized that there, there's essentially two kinds of things that we can quantify. Uh, one of them is proportion of patterns. And because you know, we've got just two notes, we can think about uh, patterns of different lengths. So if we looked at this call and we said, what's the proportion of Bs in this call? We'd you know, be able to identify all the Bs and we'd you know, say out of these, say, 20 notes, there's 10 of them, so it's 50% B sequence. Well, the other kind of thing is runs. So you want to characterize the song as not just being um, a, a set of Bs, but how many Bs do we have together? If we had a bunch of Bs together, that you could say this is heavily a, B, a, a heavy B song. So let's look at the runs of these. Well, we have a set of runs of Bs. Um, there's runs that are one run, one B, and then a couple of two Bs. And we can look at the, um, quantify the proportion of these runs in the song is it in relation to how many you might expect. And, um, oops. And for instance, 5% uh, of this song are, is runs of, 1B, whereas you know, 0.1 or 10 percent of the song is runs of two Bs. Uh, we can, and from that, we can calculate the mean of those proportions and the maximum. So on average, this is a 6 percent um, B, 6 percent um, B run or yeah, B run song, and but at max, this is 10 percent B runs. Well, that's for one note. You can do that for two notes. So let's look at BCs um, and quantify this is a, 
40% BC song. Same call, but we're just looking at it from a different perspective. And then let's look at the runs. Well, it starts to get more complex, but it's still the same thing. This is a, a on average, 16% runs of BCs. On average, and, but the most is a 30% BC. So it has, it, we can say 30% of this song is, of this call is BCs. And you can see we could do this for patterns, any set of patterns. We could do it for BC and CB. We could do it for BB, CC, and we could continue increasing the, the, the number of, of notes. Um, that takes care of sort of quantifying the song in terms of the note composition, but there's, a, of course, the feature of the interval between those notes that is, is another important component to it. So we looked at the distribution of this, this inner note interval, um, that the, the interval behind Bs and behind Cs in all of the data did some unsupervised clustering and came up with uh, a, a clustering for each, uh, for, for, for different categories of inter intervals after Bs and an, another set after Cs. But once we have that, then we can go back and say that we can define notes as patterns of, say, B1, B2, or B1, C2, and do multiple notes and multiple note N, I, and I patterns. So with, with that kind of set of, of information, we can summarize um, all of these calls into one to three note patterns, um, which there are 14 one, two, and three note patterns of two notes. Um, there are 609 of the one to three note patterns plus their I and I components. So if for all of those patterns, we are just summarizing the proportion of the pattern, the mean run proportion, the max run proportion, we end up with about 17 or 1900 different, 1900 metrics for each call. And now we can make the, the calls themselves comparable the same 1,900 metrics for every call, regardless of how long it is, regardless of how it's composed. And um, so with that, we you know, can now have a, a data matrix that allows us to compare calls. And so the, the flow is fairly straightforward. Um, we're taking the comp calls, and as Ryan was sort of describing, we're interested in looking at similarities between them. So we're calculating um, the, the, the distances between calls, and from that, we can now do some unsupervised clustering to see how similar the calls are and what sort of information we, we get out of them. There's a couple steps here that I'm going to leap over um, where we're just selecting representative calls from each region and season as opposed to looking at them all just to simplify the, the kind of question. But that process gets us to this. And this makes me comfortable and happy because it's a tree and I can deal with trees. Um, <laughs> so we are able to, you know, based on, on that, that clustering, look at um, you know, the sort of relationships amongst these kind of representative songs. Each color here is a different region and season. Um, so we have you know, sort of the Chukchi in this light blue, bearing in the dark blue, so forth. Um, and the you know, few sort of takeaways from this that I'll leave you with are the clustering does a really nice job of getting major types of so songs together. So we have three major clades, the Bs, the, S, the major Cs, and then the, the BC component, the BC songs. Um, but when I look at this and, and I'm thinking about sort of the next steps, now I've got a hypothesis I can test. Now I can say, Oh, this is really interesting. Um, we've got this really nice clade here between the Northwest Pacific, Monterey Bay, and the Gulf of California, where their song types are, are very, very similar. I've got genetic data from most of those regions, and I can now start to ask, do I see similarities in the genetic data between those regions? And it helps me to stratify those samples. So it, it, this is the tool that I've been w sort of looking for to make sense of my other data source. And, and there's some other interesting features. We have some Antarctic data. So I said most of this was from North Pacific. We have some Antarctic data, and there's a, a secondary kind of backstory with fin whales and subspecies where 
um, in, a, in a paper we did looking at the Maya genome, we saw that there was a, um, a, a trans equatorial migration where we have one, at least one successful female fin whale that migrated across the equator and their mitogenome spread in the population. And, and in the North Pacific, there are actually two very different um, mitogenome clades. When I look at the acoustics and I look at this Antarctic call and I see its relationship with these regions, I can now go back and look at the genetic data and ask how similar are those clades or what is the, the frequency of those two clades in, in this clade that is most closely related to the Antarctic. And the punchline is that clade that we see most closely related in the mitogenome to the southern hemisphere data, it actually has more representatives in this clade. So we're beginning to start to see a correlation between the genetics and the acoustics, you know, irrespective of, of actually using it as a hypothesis driving tool. So all that to, to say this is kind of the way I'm interested in bringing, the, the bringing not just acoustics and genetics, but bringing it together to start to help to um, address these questions we couldn't address before. And, and I'll kind of leave it at that. Any questions? A uh, bearing. Yeah. Um. What? Well, yeah. It's a. It becomes a. a I think a, an issue with trees. So, they're sort of far apart, but. What it's saying is that, of course, these two Antarctic groups are very close together. This is, um, you know, getting at things that have doublets in them. The Antarctic calls, at least that we have in our data, are more sort of consistent. So it's, it's very similar sets of bees. This, the difference between the I and I in that is, is, is actually much smaller. So it's, it's not picking up that pattern that you've got kind of two I and I's. It's picking up a pattern that you've got a similarity in this is more closely related to a B, 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 B even thing, while this is a B, 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 B. And, and so you're breaking it. It becomes a feature that we can see, but obviously even in those 1900 right. things, I'm not picking that up. Yeah. And, and kind of following up on that, you know, I mean, certainly you have different types of data here in terms of categorical and, you know, some stuff that's uh, you know, continuous. And in your distance metric, how are you handling that? Yeah, I've, it all ends up being a, um, right, so the, it, it all ends up being a continuous me measure. So everything in this is a continuous measure. And I've played with different um, distance metrics. I've even played with transformations of them. And with, with this, um, the, the main features for you know, the sort of main metrics I've used don't change that much because the, the measure is sort of continuous and it's bounded within a sort of reasonable range. Yeah, I don't, I don't see that much of an effect. Yes. Thank you. I was wondering to what extent is the uh, internode interval information captured in the tree? So if you could unpack. Um, yeah, I, it's a good question. It, I mean, just eyeballing it, um, you know, you can see some groupings, like this one that we were just sort of talking about, where it's clear that that internode interval is is sort of driving that clustering. I have not had the time to sort of get into that, but it's it's something I'm I'm interested in. Um, because another thing side that I haven't gone through with this is because we, you know, have the, the, the ground truth information of where and when these samples were collected, I've also done supervised clustering and I'm using, you know, building random forest models 
and I'm using those to look at uh, the feature importance. So I'm going back and saying, you know, if we if we if we we can make classifiers, and they actually end up doing for the number of cases we a number of, of of cases we have pretty well. Um, but and so in those in that in that those classifiers, does the what what um, part of that space d is the inter interval important for? And it's absolutely a great question because it'd be nice to know if it's important in one part but not important in another. Um, if I did understand, you, you only took the proportion of uh, C's and B's and double B's and, yeah. But have you thought about using um, a Markov matrix for that, like a transition probability between C's and B's and double B's and C's and silence? You could, you could also code science, silence as a, as a, as a um, symbol. And you could uh, um, get the transition probability of individual symbols, or you could extend the, the alphabet to words of two yeah. symbols, and then get the transition probability, and maybe that mm. could uh, get uh, something similar, uh, or you could combine the proportions with, uh, with the transition probabilities, but uh, a great part of the information about proportions is, is already in the transition probability of sure. the Markov, Markov matrix. So uh, I think that could be a, a good idea. That's one thing. Uh, and the other thing is uh, I, I wanted to, to ask you and uh, uh, Shannon about, um, we are working with, with bats, and uh, they're very different from birds in, the, in, in, the, in their vocaliza vocalizations because uh, for the most part, uh, it's intended for um, research, research uh, searching. And in birds, some of, uh, I, I don't think that's the case. Uh, it's, it's more about communication. And uh, that's, that's something that uh, has come to us as, a, as an advan advantage. Mm -hmm. Because um, we can cluster um, bats, uh, bat calls, um, with, um, I don't know how to say it, traffic guilds. You know, if there are carnivores or piscivores mm. or insectivores. Mm -hmm. And uh, Sometimes it's very difficult to get the um, species label, but uh, almost every time it's, it's very, very easy to, to get the ecological label from acoustics. Hmm. But I, I don't know if that's the case with, uh, with dolphins and whales. Uh, I guess they have uh, different types of calls, uh, like bats. Bats have al also social calls, but they're, they're not uh, very useful for uh, species detecting, for s detecting species. I don't know if, if whales and, and dolphins have a, like uh, some calls that are related more to the e ecology or mm -hmm. and resource um, searching and some others that are related to communication. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think if you distinguish them in this way, uh, maybe you can get some mm -hmm. uh, interesting results. We're, we're also trying to, to figure, figure out how genetics, ecology, and uh, the, uh, how do the acoustic phenotype or work together and um, uh, in, the, in the specific case of, of the bats uh, genetics and ecology are, uh, are a bit uh, entangled hmm. yeah because uh, sometimes uh, you have uh, like a gene genealogy ge uh, like um, yeah li like the tree from uh, genetics hmm. it uh, fits with uh, with the ecological data and sometimes it doesn't because mm. it's it's uh, uh, in bats there's uh, it's there are a lot lots of convergence mm. in the because of because two bats from a se separate groups can eat the same thing S so their calls are must be similar because they're searching for the same thing mm. because it's not communication mm -hmm. so distinguishing between communication and and research uh, searching it c could be useful mm -hmm. also clustered differently and that I was just anyway that that's an area that we have some recordings from I don't know if this is working or not um, from s some seismic recorders and um, and you know we thought that there could be seasonal differences but the fact that they're 
you know, the same season showing such different patterns in that ex same area. Um, I just didn't know if there were theories about what was going on. There's two that I'm aware of, and, and you know, the experts can certainly chime in, but this, you know, this data set spans sort of many years, and, um, and Anna and Aaron Olson, Anna Sherver and Aaron Olson have shown that there's um, changes in I and I over time in fin whales in the eastern North Pacific. And also um, the, the slide I, I showed from Anna's work um, that changes in frequencies. Um, that is in, frequen in, in a frequency of occurrence of, of different types of calls in different regions. Um, in the Gulf of California, there's also, um, depending on kind of where you are, potential for mixing from other Southern California animals. So the, the sort of residency um, area, the, it, it is, um, the, the, the frequency of residency is, is sort of less, especially around the, the tip, where you might have more Southern California animals coming around and going up. using machine learning or, or other techniques. When you look at the data as a domain expert and you, and you say, I see doublets, I see triplets, you're, you're using your understanding of the species and but still essentially we're, we're all doing this guessing what the, sp what the animals themselves are interpreting. And you've come up with a, with a, with a system, a, measure, a, a metric based on our interpretations of, of what's important, doublets and, and, and runs and, and, and things like that. And we don't exactly know whether that's what the animals are actually looking at. As a naive non-cetacean biologist, if I would have looked at these data, I would, and that classification of the, the clustering of the interno intervals to, to discrete groups, to me just shouts out, a, oh wow, let's do this as a Markov model. You know, you have a mm. B and then a B1, and what's the probability of mm. a B1? And I would have probably built a, a, a that kind of transition matrix, and then from transition matrices you can measure distance directly. You don't mm. need 2,000 features. Mm. If you were to redo this whole, this, this whole hierarchical clustering using a separate approach, for instance, a Markov approach, you would likely get a different hierarchical clustering. Mm. And if you were then to come back and say, looking at the ecological interpretation of who is where and who's moved where, you would be able to compare those two trees and see which one was more feasible, which was more realistic ecologically, mm. And that could then feed back and tell you something mm -hmm. about which of the, of the behavioral assumptions mm -hmm. was more realistic. Mm. So I suppose it's just, it's just a very general point that when there are multiple ways of encoding your information, sometimes mm -hmm. you, can, you can, by applying different, different encoding strategies, you can actually perhaps get a bit more of an idea of what, what's the behavioral basis by, by seeing which ones are correspond to our, our, our ecological understanding. That's a good point. Yeah. I, I agree with all the questions that have been brought up about the Markov chain stuff. Um, one of the things that did occur to me when, when I was thinking about it is that you could also model the intervals as a distribution, mm -hmm. and that might be something that might be useful. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the one concern that I, I do have a little bit, and I, I hadn't voiced it before because we all do it, is, you know, but because Art brought up this idea of our own perceptions, you know, we're putting these into back calls and, cal and, and normal calls, right? But there may be some gradation to these that, you know, is perfectly obvious to the animals that we're not picking up. Mm. And, I mean, you know, I, 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 think it's, yeah. I, I think this is really nice. I really like what you've done here. But I think we have to kind of keep that in the back of our minds. Yeah. That's so a, just a side note. That there's, there's a part of this story that I have not told where we, we took that into account. We actually didn't start off with, we did start off with these being called um, Bs and Zs by readers, mm 
And um, when I first got experienced readers, thank you. <laughs> when I first got the data, I was doing some initial analyses and and looking at them, there <coughs> things that weren't making sense. So we went back to sort of the original kind of spectral measurements and did some um, clustering and classification on on those. And they they do fall out into um, two very good clusters, two sort of distinct clusters with high classification power. The, the interesting part about that was that um, they did not match what the experienced readers called them. So this goes back to your preconceptions. Um, we had readers that were looking at sequences from certain regions, and for instance, they would see um, a string of notes, and because they made an assumption that these were all Cs, and in fact, when you looked at the entire species, they ended up being all Bs. And we had a lot of reader error relative to what sort of the species was doing. So that all goes into what I was thinking as well in terms of Markov stuff. But I was thinking about if you extended this into a Markov model as opposed to just a Markov chain where there's really an emission probability and therefore you have a metric on your observations, then you can get an overall distance that includes both transition type information and uh, observation type likelihoods mm -hmm. that you can get into an overall distance that captures both of those things and allows you to weight them or, or you know, emphasize them however you want. Where were you guys like three years ago? <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> I missed that notice. I had just one, one quick observation too. You were looking at a previous slide was looking at the distributions of I think it was the inter uh, note distance uh, interval. Um, and you, you used unsupervised clustering and it looked like you picked five clusters but I didn't see five clusters in the data. I was wondering it, if I missed something. Yeah, there was a, a round of, of um, sort of the uh, of multiple clustering um, algorithms, and and picking sort of optimal clustering. And so what I showed you was sort of the 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 overall distributions, and then the amalgamation of those clustering decisions of sort of where the clusters ended up ended up being. What's the best number of clusters? I, yeah, and there's a, there's a, a backstory to that too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so since I'm kind of new to the the field, I'm curious about the the graph that you said was really nice from one of the other papers with the kind of four pie charts on it and mm. things like that. You had mentioned that there were differences across space and time there. And it's not clear to me how you distinguish the differences in space from differences in time since there were differences in all four pie charts. Yeah, that's a good question. And it's something that Anna and I have been talking about what, what the animals are, are, are doing. Um, and it's just a, it becomes a, a feature of, it's, yeah, it's, it's a really good point. Um, what we need, of course, is to have all of these regions with hydrophones and, and recordings, you know, from all the regions at the same time for multiple years in order to really put this story together. And outside of that, we're sort of making stories up that sort of makes sense, maybe. Yeah. Yes. only now that I've, I've started teaching a first year bioinformatics course, I've realized ha what a terrible omission this is. Whenever we do clustering, we really should uh, measure the robustness of the tree. That's not something that we ever see displayed on these hierarchical trees, but there are techniques for, for, for measuring how many of the, which of those forks are actually robust and which ones aren't. Right, um, and it, yeah, so that's, yeah, so this is, and I, I've tried to use the words carefully, I mean, this is a, it's, it's a tree based off of a similarity matrix. So it is sort of a, a de the best depiction of that matrix in, you know, essentially univariate space. It, the, because the, the heights don't really have meaning to it, to them. Um, but you're right, if, if I was to do this and to actually say, this is a, a estimation 
of, of similarity amongst these regions, and I was using it essentially for more than hypothesis testing, you're right, doing sort of node um, probabilities and certainties is, is critical, because most people don't understand that this is just one of many possible representations of the similarity of these things. Yeah, good point. about the interpretation of the calls themselves, is there an underlying assumption that all of the calls have meeting, meaning mm -hmm. in terms of communication or um, you know, locating one another, or, or is there some presumption that some or some percentage of the calls in these sequences are just totally arbitrary and they're, it's, you know, it's like they're singing themselves just to keep themselves busy, or I, I don't know if, if there's any broader interpretation of what's going on. So that, that's, uh, it's actually brings up a good issue that um, I think plays into some of the other questions we have here. So these calls are selected um, during a period where the potentially the calls, so Aaron Olson has shown that, there, that this, the, the inner note interval changes in a somewhat predictable manner increases over the course of a year. So it, at, at one part of the year, if you measure it, it's lower. And as um, you get closer in sort of breeding, it increases. And, and because it seems that only males sing, these calls are sort of assumed to be related to reproduction. So they sort of peak, level off, and then start again lower at the next year round. And they seem to do this synchronously across the ocean basin. So these, this, most of this data is collected kind of during this ramp up. And it's therefore potentially not what, as I understand, the exhibition is referred to as being crystallized. It, it is not the full breeding call, the pluses and minuses. If we're looking at relationships amongst um, you know, breeding groups, we haven't reached that peak where they are, you know, they're what they're, what's being selected on. But if we have um, you know, some sort of random selection, even the non-crystallized sound, if, if, I can, if you can create a classifier that has high accuracy and we believe that this is the thing that's being produced there, even in that ramp up period, um, it still could be useful for determining that or making statements about differences amongst regions or, or similarities amongst regions. So yeah, it, it is for breeding, but I think it is important to um, have some understanding, obviously, about what it's uh, being used for and, and if there is variability around when you're collecting it. 